greatest boxer right now in the world, pound for pound. He's the best. You know what I mean? Like, and then when I show him to people, everybody's like, oh my God, he's really good. I'm all, right? Let's uh, talk a little bit about your fighting career. You have uh, ups and downs, and what was the most satisfying victory and the most uh, devastating loss for you? Um, all losses are devastating. You know, we, we pretty much always try to be successful. And, you know, fighting is about dominating yourself and dominating your opponent. So every time we fall short, you know, uh, when I was younger, I used to have a harder time with it, but then as I got older, not that I'm okay with losing, but I very much use it as a learning uh, uh, opportunity. Okay, what did I fail at? What did I do? And I'm such a student of actual martial arts, and, and especially now in the last about year, I've tried to kind of, I've emptied my plate of too many distractions around me. Other people telling me how to fight or how to do things. I've kind of almost became my own coach because now I really want to see what I understand and what I really know. Um, and so, uh, as far as most satisfying victory is the second time I fought Noguera. Uh, and the reason being is because in the fight I was losing. Um, he caught me with a punch right on the ear, threw off my legs real bad. Uh, he was this close to finishing me with a choke, you know, I've never been submitted before in MMA. And so, uh, to come back and come through, I like that because, you know, I'm a father, I can sit there and tell my children, like, look, in life, you're not always going to be winning from the opening bell. Sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes you don't make any mistakes, but life just throws a, uh, a perfect game at you, and you know you're going to stumble. And until you get buried, you you still have time. There's always a way to try to figure out and, and overcome, and just you go until the end of the bell. And I did that in that fight. I didn't look to find a way out. I just kept rolling with. The, the, the motion and trying to figure out a way to win and I was able to catch his arm and submit him and be the first person to ever submit Noguera who's a high level black belt in Jiu Jitsu so um, it was very rewarding for that for the, the, the whole setup of what happened. How much arms you broke? You're a famous arm collector. <laughs> the arm collector. Let's see I think Roberto Tran in my very first fight I think his arm got fractured in the fight he had to go to the hospital and was in a sling afterwards uh, Tim Sylvia, his arm broke. Uh, Noguera, his arm broke. I think that's it as far as arm breaks. Uh, Three hands. Yeah. Good number. <laughs> Decent. Uh, but I'm not. Uh, I'm not an asshole when it comes to submitting people. If I have you in a submission, you can watch the Brock Lesnar fight. I have his legs straight. I'm in perfect position to break his leg. Uh, he starts tapping. As soon as he stopped tapping, I didn't let the submission go, but I stopped applying pressure. I knew that I had it, so I didn't increase my pressure. I kept it the same. And if you look at the fight, you see me look for the referee. Yeah. I'm looking to say, hey, you know, can you stop the fight? Uh, I've seen other guys who keep going even after the guy's tapping. And I know you shouldn't let the guy go, and I don't, because if the referee misses it, you don't get the win. Uh, but I think that, you know, this isn't, someone didn't steal my wallet, you know, they're not trying to beat up my wife or take my children from me. It's a battle as a warrior to make myself stronger. And I need the other guy to be a strong warrior to make me strong. And then we can go back to the gym and try to make ourselves strong. There's no uh, reward in maiming my opponent, unless it happens by accident. I've, if I have you in a submission and you don't tap, well, that tells me I don't have it right, so I'm going to try to increase pressure. And as I increase pressure, if it breaks, which has happened in the past, when I break someone's uh, limb, that, well, you didn't tap, so then I kept on going. I obviously I didn't have it, right? But uh, that's a choice they made. But as soon as someone taps, I let go. Or even if I know they're hurt, there was one time I choked out uh, the, uh, the Frenchman, uh, Czech Congo. Chikonga. So as soon as I knew he was asleep, you see me look up at the referee, and I, you know, even before the ref checked, I told him, he's out. Now, I didn't try to get a cheap move in and try to hurt his neck. Uh, I, I didn't try to add anything to it. I held the choke in case I was wrong. There was always a small margin of error. But uh, I went ahead and called the referee in for his safety. You know, hey, I won, just you check him. Uh, he lifted up his arm and dropped, and then as soon as he goes, okay, it's over with, and I let go. But I didn't keep increasing and try to hurt his neck. Uh, and so that's the difference between me and other fighters that I've seen that have hurt people. Not all of them, but I've seen those guys that they think, well, I'm going to try to make sure I get a break. And, you know, the people are tapping, referees on top of them, trying to break their grip. I don't agree with that. 
I think that's wrong. You've never seen me in any fight ever do that to anybody, whether it was just jujitsu, submission grappling, uh, MMA. I've never held something too long. Uh, you mentioned Brock Lesnar. I uh, read your statement and I read uh, Brock's book. And uh, question, uh, did you guys really uh, hate each other so hard or it's no. part of the game? It was part of the game. In fact, leading up to our second fight, I remember we did a, a photo shoot at a Red Rock Casino. And, um, you know, Brock actually initiated the conversation. We're sitting there and he goes, hey, may I speak with you for a second outside? So we walked out to the pool area. And then we had a conversation where he's like, "Hey, look, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, this is a, this is a business. We're here to make money, so let's make sure we sell this fight." And you know, I was like, "Oh, I, I know where you're going. So you know, make sure we, you know, we talk crap leading up to the fight. You know, to 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 make ticket sales big. Um, it made sense to me. And I, you know, I think the only thing I said was like, "Well, yeah, just no wives, no children." And he goes, "Yeah, no, obviously." And so that's why leading up to the fight, we were both talking trash to try to gain interest in the fight. Um, and that's why after the fight. He won, and I remember staring at him because he's still screaming and yelling, and I was very confused. I was like, wait a minute, the marketing's over with. Everybody bought the tickets, well, what are you doing? Uh, that you know, threw me off a little bit. That's why I'm kind of staring at him a little confused because you know, before the fight, during the fight, I'm ready for that. After the fight, I wasn't ready for us to keep talking trash. Uh, and so then, uh, so then after that, it probably became more personal for a little while, but now I, I don't care. You know, I mean, would I like to fight him a third time? Yeah. It would make a lot of money. It's financially uh, advantageous. As far as anything like getting even, I've submitted him, he beat me. I'd like to fight him a third time, but I'd like to fight a lot of people again. Uh, who was the uh, most annoying uh, your opponent? Who is the most annoying guy? Uh, Czech Congo was kind of annoying. And not because uh, he didn't speak a lot, uh, talk trash, but when we were doing interviews leading up to the fight of the week, uh, the week of the fight, you know, you sit with. Yeah, the, the production crew and they make all the videos that are going to be played before you uh, you walk out. And when I walked in, they're like, oh, he says he wants to piss on you, he hates you. I'm like, what did I do? You know what I mean? Like, I know we're going to fight each other and I get it that, you know, there's a competitive nature to it, but hate me? Like, why? Well, he says you made fun of his ground skills. I'm like, you mean in the show when we're counting down talking shit? Yeah. He's not very good on the ground. All I said was that he's one of the worst guys. And it's not, I never really, even when I talk crap to sell a fight, you can't really make up a personality. You can't just, I'm not a good enough actor to completely pretend I'm somebody else. So what I've always done was I just, uh, almost like how like when you drink it magnifies, I just try to uh, increase a part of my personality. So the cocky, kind of like, you know, boisterous, I'll just, that's a part of me, not as big as I make it out to be on camera. But if that's what they want to sell tickets, then I try to emphasize that. And so all I had said leading up is I never make things up. It'd be like me saying that his stand-up is no good. He has really good stand-up. Why would I say that? That sounds stupid. But his ground skills were not very good. So I just I said, oh, I know his ground skills aren't very good. And even afterwards, I'm like, if we all did a jiu-jitsu tournament right now, all the heavyweights, do you think he would win it? If it'd be him and Pat Berry fighting for who's last. You know, who's the worst jiu-jitsu guy in the heavyweight division. Um, so it wasn't like I, so for him to be offended, that kind of shocked me. I was like, what are you offended about? You're not very good on the ground. You're a good standard guy. If I had called you fat, you could be offended because that's a stupid statement. He was built like, you know, Hercules. Uh, but to say something that has truth behind it, that's just reality. And so he was very angry. Press conference before the fight, like two days before, the day before, it's like the Wednesday. And so uh, I'm trying now to kind of fix it a little bit with him, you know, like, hey, relax, man. So when I go up there, you know, it was expecting me to, you know, okay, this is time to talk trash. So I was trying to be nice. And I was like, all right, you know, I'm not going to come up here and exchange words. It wouldn't be fair because, you know, this is not his native language. How are you supposed to compete with me in a conversation of talking trash? I couldn't compete with you in, if we were speaking French right now. I wouldn't even know how to, you know, begin to start. And so everybody's like, you know, so all I said, it wouldn't be fair competition to be up here. You know, I'll, I'll go where it's, a, you know, fair, even field on the night of the fight. And the whole crowd are going, ooh. So I'm kind of looking around like, what did I do? I just said that, that I'm going to let him, you know, we're going to go fight, not talk trash. And then my wife's looking at me like, mm. So afterwards I'm like, what went wrong? She's all, you basically said he's not on your level intellectually. That, you know, it's not fair, I'm not even gonna compete with you in a shit-talking contest. I'm all, no, the guy doesn't speak English. 
that's what I mentioned. So, uh, that's not how it came off. I'm like, fuck, I can't win. So it was like one of those things where like, you know, you mess up with somebody, no matter what you do to fix it, you keep making it worse. So I'm like, ah. So that way the, at the weigh-ins, he, uh, he turned his back to me like he wasn't going to square off with me. So funny enough, I'm like, oh, you know, the old like, you know, jujitsu threat, like I'm going to put you to sleep, you know? So I did that with my hands and laughed. And then afterwards I put him to sleep. So it kind of worked out pretty good for me. It was a, a good day. Good moment. Yeah, good moment. Ups and downs. We all have good and bad moments. It's how you deal with both. Both good moments can test you because success can be very dangerous. It can make you weak and make you uh, leave the line. And then, uh, you know, and then failures can also test you because it can discourage you and then make you leave the line and not continue on the path of martial arts. Um, and I think people see that in life all the time. That's why, you know, um, you know, uh, somebody's father is very rich and they give them any money they want. What usually happens to that person? And they become very weak. You know, and someone has too hard of a life, sometimes they become very discouraging. So I think life is good about having a balance of success and failures. You know, and both, you know, success helps give you motivation, but failure helps give you direction on where to go. Uh, and if you talk about uh, ground game, who was the uh, best uh, Jiu Jitsu of your opponents? Oh, obviously, uh, Noguera was the one time I was honestly afraid. I mean, I've always, every fight I'm afraid. Anybody, if you have a secret right now to not be afraid when you walk into a fight, please share it with me. Because uh, I'm nervous every time I go to commentate, fight. Anytime there's a lot of people watching me do something, you could be watching me eat a sandwich. If there's 10,000 people watching, I'm nervous. Uh, and so, um, uh, Noguero is probably the one time that it, it took something out of me mentally. Because in all my other fights, I kind of always knew that, like, okay, well, I have an edge here. You know? Um, and that gave me a sense of security. And then with Noguera, I was like, man, this guy was a black belt before I even started training in jiu-jitsu. He's better than I am in jiu-jitsu, you know? And so it took away that comfort zone that I've had in other fights. And I liked that because I never realized, like, oh, this is a weakness of mine. I'm so used to being the better grappler that I just take it for granted. Um, man, that was a fault. That was, you know, that's an unfair advantage that I had in my mind that gave me security. Like, now that it was taken away, I'm like, oh, now we'll really see how I can deal with this mentally. How I can go in there and fight somebody who I know that if I just pure grappled them, you know, might not come out on top. I know that you work uh, as a bouncer as, yeah. and, and security chief. Uh, could you tell your favorite uh, story about this work? And not get sued? <laughs> no, I, I, was, I think I was very good at this job being a, a bouncer, a security host at the, the Rhino in Las Vegas. Because, uh, one, I don't relish in hurting people unless they deserve it. You know, like to me, I feel like I'm like more of a hunter. You know, I'll kill something if I need to eat. I'm not going to just kill it for killing it, you know, just so I can, you know, brag. Uh, and the same thing with fighting, you know, I, I believe violence is important and it solves a lot of problems. Um, you know, everybody wants to have a strong military, you know. Um, and the same thing in life. I, I don't look to hurt people for the sake of hurting them. But if, uh, if my words fail, well then that's the next step. I have to, you know, uh, protect somebody or protect myself, then you're going to get hurt. Uh, and so I, and I think because I had that approach as a, a bouncer, uh, very much try to talk to people. I enjoyed it. I like that, you know, game of how can I try to get you on my side while you're drunk and angry and you're already, I mean, everything I have going against me and you see me and I'm wearing the suit with the patch on it. You hate me before I've opened my mouth. Uh, you know, and then how can I turn the situation around? And so I took great pride that, you know, most, more often than not, uh, the guys would, you know, okay, I see, you know, okay. And, pay their bill and you know, have a good time uh, and not want to fight and uh, you know every once in a while it did happen but uh, I never had a problem you know because Vegas and, and you know the US in general you have to worry you know if you beat somebody up real bad and they don't deserve it they're gonna know they didn't deserve it right and that guy goes home and he has a gun yeah. and he thinks about you and then you're walking out of work a week later you forgot about that guy but he didn't forget about you and uh, I've known bouncers that have been shot, and uh, <laughs> uh, more than one. And so uh, I've always made sure that any time I ever had to hurt somebody, 
they deserved it, they needed it, they asked for it, they gave me no other choice but to hurt them, and I only hurt them enough to win the point, and as soon as I knew they broke, then I didn't go any farther. So that's probably why I never had anybody try to stab me or shoot me afterwards, because I was very fair when it came to dealing uh, violence. But, you know, when anybody needed it, I was more than capable and ready to go ahead and give it to them. Frank, I have uh, two girl questions for you. Okay. Um, I'm uh, your Instagram follower, and uh, tell me one thing. Why does uh, so big, uh, strong guy like you uh, like very cute small dogs? Oh, <laughs> ah, well, I love my puppies. Uh, it's funny because I had the dog I had before and during. My wife, she bought those dogs for herself. And there, one of them, uh, named Thule, is now my dog. In fact, if I'm on the bed and Thule's on the bed and my wife goes to give me a kiss, Thule growls and bites her and I'm very much her property. And so uh, before that, actually, I had a, a great day and girl. Uh, but she, had, she passed away about two years ago, so I'm not ready for any more dogs besides the ones we have. But uh, um, I think some people, you know, they pick dogs different things. Uh, I just, my wife picked those out and they're in the house and I grew very attached to them very quick. Uh, they have great personalities and, you know, I don't need to define myself by having a big, tough dog so that someone thinks, oh, you know, look at that, yeah. <laughs> don't worry about the dog, worry about me. Tell me about your um, big uh, back tattoo. Oh, um, actually one of my training partners, James Horn, the uh, guy, only guy I've ever given a black belt to in Jiu Jitsu. A uh, very close friend of mine, and uh, he has a lot of back work, and so I just always thought that was a very impressive uh, 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 area of your body that you could really, you know, um, tattoos are descriptions of yourself, your personality, you're trying to say things, and so I saw my back as an opportunity to, you know, to express myself. So that's why I, I chose a, a Tenchi, you see there's a demon underneath, and then a rhino uh, with a, 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 like basically a demon samurai uh, riding it, and the reason why I chose different things, they all have symbolism to me. And you see there's uh, a cage on the outlining of it. And once I finish it, the storm clouds and, and lightning bolts will be on there. But uh, I, I told my, actually, uh, Brian, who I'm sharing a room with here, the other commentator, Lacey, and uh, we were talking about the tattoo on my back. And I was like, he goes, you know, when are you going to finish it? I'm like, man, now that I have three kids and they're older and they're so busy, you know, you sit down and get a tattoo sometimes, for, you know, four or six hours at a time. And I probably still have 20, 30 more hours to go and I'm about 50 hours into it. I just can't find the time where I'm not doing anything. My kids aren't doing anything. And we, I can go sit down and just and get tattoo work done. So um, one of these days, hopefully I'll, I'll get back in there and get it going. But uh but right now, uh, no. And then, like I said, the, the different symbolism, you know, different things on the tattoo mean different things to me. For example, like the rhino. Um, I liked that uh, symbolism because I read about how the rhino um, really has no natural predator. You know, people, uh, the, all the other animals in the uh, jungle, uh, they leave rhinos alone, you know. But the rhino is a very peaceful vegetarian. You know, he's not out to hurt anybody. But if you get in his path, he'll hurt you. And I was like, wow, that's... I relate to that, you know, I'm not out trying to hurt anybody, but if you get in my way and you don't give me any other choice, then, then you know, hurt you I must. 